Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Today, it's, uh, we are glad to have um, Professor Xue with us. Um, and he is um, from UCLA. And his research interest is on land surface modeling and land atmosphere ocean interactions. Um, he will be talking about the uh, remote effects of land temperature in Rocky Mountains and, and Bento Plateau. It's welcome, Professor Xue. Okay, thank you. So, uh, it's uh, my it's an honor to be here to give a presentation at your institute. And I'm very glad to see many older friends, and in particularly, um, so Professor Akin, <laughs> so give you his uh, recent book, that is great. And also, I need to thank you for uh, uh, so Professor Biolao to invite me here. So uh, my talk today is about the remote effects. We talk about the land surface thermal interaction. This is the remote effects, particularly folks on the Rocky Mountain and the Tibetan Plateau. And uh, so, uh, so my talk is mostly focused on the, the GUX gas, LS4P, the first phase activity. Uh, so LS4P is impact of initialization, initialized land surface temperature and a snowpack on sub-seasonal to seasonal prediction. So LS4P stands for the land surface for prediction, or S to the fourth. So we have a four S. S. So the surface, subsurface temperature, sub-seasonal and seasonal uh, so prediction. And two thank you to member in ASIC, Professor Biolao and Professor Xin Zhongliang, they actively participate in this activity. So uh, first, we talk about uh, this ideal development because uh, uh, most uh, land atmosphere interaction folks uh, on the uh, surface characteristic like snow, soil moisture, vegetation. Uh, so why we use land surface temperature, summer surface temperature? Uh, in the prediction, in, so uh, of course, for summer seasonal season prediction, this of a temperature has been played a major role for the such as e, uh, so extreme events like a drought and flooding. And SRT has been shown sure have a predictive value for land precipitation. So that is for sure. Uh, SRT play a dominant role. However, it's uh, so based on data analysis, it shows it uh, can explain about uh, uh, so, uh, uh, 30%, 40%. The so level of variance between uh, the SAT and the precipitation. So it's uh, uh, not to say 100%, but uh, it's about 30, 40%. And in particular, recent phenomena uh, caused people aware we might need to find uh, more uh, other factors which contribute to the S to S predictability in, uh, in addition to SAT. For instance, in California during 2015, 2016, that was one of the strongest ANSO events since 1950s. So according to the normal relationship, it, California should be wet. But it was uh, extraordinarily California drought. In 2016 and 2017, next year was La Nina, supposed to be dry, but uh, the rain is ex very extensive rain actually did actually stop, actually finish, eliminate the California drought, five year five, so California drought. So that's mean we have to in consider more factors. Another factor consider in the study was the snow. Snow, uh, so my talk is more focused on the third pole area, that's the uh, Tibetan Plateau and the Himalaya. Uh, so for the for the Eurasia, it's a different. So in Himalaya, winter snow and the Indian monsoon, that solution has been proposed by so uh, by the Blanford in 1884. So there is a relation. In 1910, Walker proposed outer phase relationship between May Himalaya snow and Indian monsoon. So the data analysis following up was. Uh, Continue support this, support this, this uh, this relationship. However, 
there was a, a, a difficulty because so far, so Bamze and Shukla point out there were only a few years for which Himalaya winter snow cover are normally persistent through spring. So Alan Roberts, he, he was a faculty in University of Maryland before, he shall study show soil moisture memory is short and cannot be used as a bridge to link the winter snow cover and the subsequent summer monsoon. And in fact, after about a century use in the India, Meteorology department using snow as a long term predictor for India monsoon in after yeah, 1999, Himalaya snow has no longer been used as a predictor. And also, so far, although there were many studies using uh, Himalaya uh, snow, but uh, most of its sensitivity used no snow or uh, with snow, not for the uh, sub seasonal you know, prediction. But, uh, so the data analysis certainly is supported the relationship. So we, so I also our hypothesis is a temporary field response to snow anomaly over high mountain may be pres preserved in the land surface temperature anomaly. We feel the snow effects may be better preserved, so preserved in the land. So now we, so why we use land temperature? We further give some observation. So observational evidence, because some people argue land has much lower heat capacity, has much moisture compared with the ocean. So, how, so, uh, so, so that's why they feel only ocean can be used for S2S prediction, land memory is too short. But I have to point out that land's memory, land's heat capacity is lower but because this is lower, so it's responding to natural radiation much strong at a diurnal, in, so sub-seasonal and a seasonal scale. So it's a responding is strong. So that's the, that's the a probability for land to produce, provide this, uh, the predictability. And also evidence shows this land memory, land anomaly is not to say just a few days. For instance, in 1998, that was in Tibetan Plateau, show the anomaly 1990A. Because 1990A in China in the summer was extraordinarily, extraordinarily flooding, wet year. And based on the thing I will talk about, we will we'll point out that the warm spring temperature in Tibetan Plateau will cause flooding in summer in, uh, in the south of Yangtze River. So you can see 1990A, this anomaly persistent for many months. It's not a very instantaneous. In 1911, this is the West US. So I think we maybe still have memory. 2011, there was a severe drought in Southern Grand Plain. According to the thing I will talk about, the cold spring in West US, high mountain area, Rocky Mount will produce drought in the southern Grand Plain. You can see 2011 is extraordinarily cold spring. So this, this anomaly is not only, you know, exists a few days, so it's persistent for several months. And in particularly, some people argue this is a surface temperature they have, because there are few places has measurement for subsurface temperature. So in Tibetan plateau, so there is a project called a third pole, it's third pole environment. So there are many stations. So the black station is surface measurements, the red station got the deeper subsurface measurement, still three meters. So we have the, a warm spring minus the cold spring. You can see the warm spring, six years cold spring, Five years, the difference you can see this anomaly was persistent for about five months. Five months. And this anomaly was supported by snow, particularly snow in February. And also is supported by the subsurface, subsurface anomaly. So this anomaly is exists and 
quite long. So then we using the data, observation data, two meter data, and, and so may two meter temperature and dual precipitation do a MC analysis. The MC is maximum covariance analysis. So previous was using uh, called the SVD. And so Professor Law using this for, for many papers. It shows the May, the first modes, the MCM modes show is the West US Rocky Mountain area. Temperature, if it's warm, the southern Grand Plain will be wet, will be wet. To the north will be dry. So this correlation is 69, uh, 0 0.69, 0 0.69. And uh, here also just scatter plotting. Well, it's for June, July, and it's for uh, June, July, and March to April, May. Landscape temperature show a scanning plot with a significant correlation. So when, like uh, 2011, when it was cold, then it should be uh, dry. So the two meter observation, this one uses the CAMS. That was produced by uh, NOAA. I think, uh, so Professor, I think you know CAMS, right? Yeah. 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 So the basement gate. And uh, I, want, I just want to point out, this actually two meter temperature is the, for the land surface variable is the most reliable measurements and has long history. But we didn't use this very much, actually. Quite people mostly use it for preparation. So this is the, this is the, so CAMS temperature. Preparation is also, is your, is a NOAA CPC preparation. So then for the East Asia, also this is Tibetan Plateau, this MC analysis shows Plateau. If the plateau is cold, source of Yangtze River will be dry, to the north will be wet. So this uh, CC correlation is 0 0.57. Uh, so it also shows significant relationship. So that was based on data support. That there is a relationship. Uh, now we based on those uh, events, like uh, we did some initial tests for the 2011 South Korean plane drought. 2015, southern Grand Plain flooding. And 2003, to the south of Yangtze River was flooding, to the north was a drought, was a drought. So the first case here show is a 2011 uh, drought case. So we using both NCEP, uh, GFS, and also use WOLF to do the simulation. So both coupled with a landscape model, SSRB. So, the WOLF basically download the NCEP GCM simulation. This is because the global model, the drought and flooding position is not that accurate. After download with the regional model, then the drought will precise in the southern Grand Plain. Okay, so that's what we, 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 uh, we download. But the, in East Asia, actually, uh, because the WOLF has bias in East Asia, so, so, the, so the GFS showed better results, actually. So for 2011, as we showed earlier, so May, the anomaly cold, very large. And then we also try to compare with the sea surface temperature effects. So this is the sea surface temperature anomaly, the Pacific Ocean. Uh, so we impose, in the first time step, we start from simulation around May 1. We have several multi, uh, uh, so, uh, so initial conditions. We start from May 1, and we impose this, then eventually we get the May average. We try to reproduce, but the model actually, at this point, at that time in particular, had a difficult to keep the memory in the soil. So basically, it's about half so normally would produce. Then we look at the precipitation. That was a drought, 2011, June. So, then we saw both, we, when we, why is the control, why is it imposed this cold temperature? So the temperature 
And also we replace this year's SD by climatology, so see SAT effects. So both contribute to the drought. When they add together SAT plus surface temperature, subsurface temperature anomaly, and uh, then we produce a, a one was close to observation. Here I want to point out this initial condition is basically some import to the subsurface. Because only if you only import to the surface just a day, the anomaly will go, it disappears. You have to have some surface temperature to make uh, the anomaly memory last longer. So that was uh, when they add together, it's uh, so better. Oh, so uh, this is for the temperature also. Then because that uh, year it was a heat wave. So temperature also need to have both effects. To produce. Second case is 2003. 2003, as I point out, this was a very cold uh, Tibetan plateau. And uh, also, that year, SAT was uh, actually with La Nina. So the SAT here is cold. So we impose uh, initial surface temperature at the first time step. Afterwards, model just generate its uh, free run to generate anomaly. So produce a normally compatible to the observed. Then this is, uh, here I only show the land surface effects. This is observed anomaly when May temperature in Tibetan plateau is was cold, so it uh, produced, it, so it was very dry. It was drought to the south of Yangtze River, wet to the north of Yangtze River. So the model, and so the GFS basically produced very nicely is a wet dry boundary. So draw to the source, wet to the north. If, uh, so we also did a test for SAT. So for actually we have three cases initially, May 2015 flooding, June 2011 drought, June 2003 uh, to the source of Yangtze was, was dry. So in the we compare with land and ocean. So basically, in the North America, land is, uh, has more contribution. For instance, this is SAT, 34% contribution land. This is a subsurface temperature is 29% is contribution. For 2011, SAT is 45. This uh, land is, uh, and temperature is 31%. And for the June, Sansuli Yangtze River, land has a much larger contribution, 58%, and the SAT is 32%. And uh, of course, because the Tibetan Plateau is much closer to the Yangtze River compared with the, uh, the La Nina, SAT anomaly. But uh, in any case, it shows this uh, high mountain spring temperature effects as comparable to the SAT effects. Uh, so, uh, what's the mechanism? Here, I just show one mechanism we published in JGR 2015 was the flooding, very wet, and the spring was very warm, very hot actually. So, the uh, warm temperature in the model generates a strong sensible heat flux, uh, produce a job potential high uh, normally over the Rocky Mountain. And uh, in the US, North America, so there's a general circulation pattern. Here is a ridge so to the south here. And uh, when we have a high geopotential, normally it perturbates to the uh, east through the, through the low simply wave. So here's high, here's low. When, so this uh, source would component even, so this is a little bit exaggerated. If it's a blocking, it will be very strong move to the source. And normally there's a source with a component, so it's a gradual move from the north to the source. When they reach the Bay of Gulf of Mexico, then there's plenty of moisture. So this cyclone structure will produce moisture convergence, so it will amplify. At one point, they don't need the initial trigger. Itself, the feedback, moisture feedback, will sustain to produce a dry and or wet condition. 
And uh, also, so, uh, this uh, anomaly and the, uh, of, you know, for some people question, uh, so where the anomaly come from, how this anomaly persistent? And uh, we have some studies here uh, it actually show it's the, so the duration, this uh, surface temperature anomaly associated with uh, snow, particularly February snow, and also subsurface temperature. Here is a, a study published in GRL shows the February snow condition was associated with Arctic oscillation and West Pacific activities. So you will see it produce a two, this is Tibetan uh, plateau, so produce uh, the wave activity flux, the so WAF wave activity flux, uh, wave, uh, so activity uh, flux, flux. So one go to the, to the source of the Tibetan plateau, one go to the north of the Tibetan plateau. Both will influence the moisture transport and the humidity there um, affect the snow, 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 snow condition in Tibetan Plateau in, in February. And uh, so basically it shows both uh, uh, Arctic Oscillation and West Pacific contribute to this phenomena. Only one will not uh, sufficient. So, so when we produce those results, then cause a community interesting. So they feel they need to uh, uh, evaluate. We feel they need to evaluate if that model we present is model dependent, if they could be reproducible. So uh, GWAX and GAS, they initial this as a 4 p project. So these projects will just try to study the impact of initialization, large scale, LST sub T in the high mountain area to, for the S2, S prediction, and also try to compare with SAT. So first phase was uh, focus on the uh, Tibetan plateau. We choose Tibetan plateau as the first phase, although we study actually from North America, is because Tibetan plateau has more observational data. Some people argue, you know, uh, you suspect you hypothesis the summer surface temperature will produce this memory. Therefore, no, no evidence because in US measurements only go to 40 inches, no subsurface. Only Tibetan Plateau has measurements go to three meters to support our hypothesis. And also Tibetan Plateau is much high. So, so far we have a 20 Earth system model and a 10 regional, uh, regional, oh, so regional climate models. And uh, so those uh, Earth Center models include uh, uh, so many uh, so meteorological administrations from Australia, Canada, Japan, France, uh, South Korea, China, uh, ECMWF, and many institutions worldwide. So and in US, we have DOE, uh, NASA, uh, NSEP, uh, and uh, so other institutions in the regional climate model, uh, so Professor Liang will participate in this activity. So uh, we have uh, three uh, workshops. One is in 2018 AGU. We kick off these experiments in 2019. Some, in summer 2019, we have a second workshop because this thing is a new thing. So we actually all more, our group spend uh, about uh, uh, 15 years. Uh, to study this. Uh, we found this phenomena in 2000, but the first paper we published in 2012 until we find out what's the mechanism behind it. Uh, so uh, there are many technical issues. We get a second workshop help the group solve the uh, technical issues. And uh, also the third wor uh, workshop is in San Francisco. That's the almost, we have a major result from first activity. So Professor Sabira participated three working group organized help him to second working group. So I come here because I we just consider to have a workshop this summer in Europe in Essex. Okay. So to 
to discuss the transition because at this point, community more convinced this effect, we will move to North America. We will move to North America from Tibetan Plateau to North America. We will talk about why this move is important. So there's uh, several tasks in this uh, experiments. First, uh, for first phase for Tibetan Plateau, first uh, is each group run a uh, 2000 uh, May to June 2003. So, to see uh, their model bias. Because uh, as I said, the original thinking is to try to reproduce, see if uh, my our group's results can be reproduced. So we want to see each model, the, the bias. If uh, every model has no bias in Tibetan Plateau, then we have no need to do the experiment because it's perfect. But uh, I'm pretty sure every model has bigger bias in mountain. Tibetan Plateau and, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and Rocky Mountain. And I told, uh, told them, you should not feel shame if you are a model like ECMWF. You should not feel shame if you have larger bias. The larger the bias, the better for our project. <laughs> okay. So they're very happy to submit the results. So the thing is, when you look at the bias, for instance, this is May 2003, have cold temperature, has uh, had a dry to the south, wet to the north. So this model bias is too warm. Then you see very wet. So that's mean the relation, if they improve this uh, warm bias, it's possible to reduce this wet bias. So that's why we want to check. And actually every model is, has a very big bias over the plateau. And uh, so, we get that this model have a 21 model the results. We do an average. Uh, so most of the model actually was, has a, a warm bias. Some has a cold bias, but uh, we for warm bias, because 2003 was a cold. So for warm bias, we multiply by minus one. So make everything is cold. So we add it together to show when the model is a cold bias, this is a structure may compare with observe the 2003 anomaly. See, this is show actually some link between Tibetan Plateau temperature and the North Pole area. You can see this wave here. So this uh, basically we try to compare this, uh, uh, so, uh, so, so the bias to see if there's a probability we use this uh, kind of approach can improve the model uh, as to as a simulation. So this is a May two meter temperature. Then we see the June, June precipitation. So June, so this is observed anomaly. Then we see, because this selection, norm, uh, this is anomaly, 2003. So it's uh, to the, so now we can see actually in June 2003, anomalies everywhere, not only in East Asia. East Asia is a small part, but also in North America, for instance. Then we saw the model bias. Model bias, we see not only is consistent with East Asia, but in North America, you can see very similar. In North of South America, and in Sahel, weather bias, and uh, in Europe, Eurasia. So actually, uh, we start from think about East Asia, but from 20 model results, we found that the issue is not only in East Asia. The Tibetan Plateau may have global influence. You can see these two have the correlation is 0 0.57. This observational data, this model data, they yeah. come from very different sources, very different sources. But they have a high correlation. This is not a, by a coincidence. Certainly, stimulate our thinking. The Tibetan plateau temperature will have global influence. Then, of course, the question is: We look at the 2003. If this is just for this year, so we ask uh, some because in our group there's many from the bigger data center. So they uh, provide the their climatology for May 2 meter temperature and June precipitation. 
So we found that this is uh, observe, observe, observation. So two meter temperature, normally cold temperature. This is observed when this two meter temperature, uh, this is 2003 normally. Then we found the climatology, we choose a very cold year, very warm year in spring. We do a difference. For based upon this difference, we look at the May temperature and the June precipitation. We found uh, this 2003 anomaly and the climatology is uh, kind of consistent. When you have cold Tibetan plateau temperature, you have wet southern Grand Plain. You have dry south of Yangtze River. And the only difference of 2003 climatology is in the north South America, because uh, 2003, as I mentioned, was a La Nina year. SAT is very, maybe very dominant in this place. So, so, th so that's what we, at the deep point, we confirm this anomaly pattern in 2003 is not uh, for this year, but for whole cold year was persistent. And we also see the model, this is 21 model, the bias for May 2003, this is 13 model climatology. Their pattern also very consistent. So then we confirm that the, so this is effort that we do for 2003 is meaningful, is useful. So the task three is main task. Then we try to, for instance, we try to improve the model. So for instance, this, this model, 2003 was cold, but this model is very cold. So for this model, try to improve this cold bias we impose a warm mask over the plateau for the first time step. So of course, uh, eventually they use uh, some impose a warm mask, some impose a cold bar mask. So they eventually we have, so far we have 14 model results. So 14 model, the example mean produce 70% observed anomaly. But uh, in, in Siberia, this anomaly was not produced. It's apparently this anomaly is not produced by the Tibetan plateau. And then we look at the global June 2003. Uh, then this is observed anomaly. This is uh, model. So model produce when you impose a cold temperature. We see for the, for instance, the East Asia 14 models, East Asia to the south of Yangtze River produce a cold. Uh, produce a dry condition, wet condition to the north. And for US, produce a wet condition to the southern Grand Plain, and the dry condition to the northwest US and southwest Canada, and uh, wet condition to the north of uh, South America. So those are consistent with the observed anomaly. And uh, here is the model. Uh, you know, this uh, we choose this is because they produce a statistical significant results so far. Like East Asia, you can see, so there are many model results. This is uh, uh, example mean. Basically, you can see most model produce a dry condition. Some model basically is neutral. For the for the Grand Plain, you can see most model produce a wet condition. Only one model is off. But uh, so it's uh, the significant level is quite uh, high, quite high. So that uh, is uh, the uh, current condition. So we confirm at this point based on 14 model results, but we will expect to get a more model, but we will not change these results very much. And uh, so, so why there is a relation? Uh, so, so Professor Law is sitting here. Now he uh, remember his early study the result because uh, U.S. precipitation has uh, East Asia, so that is his uh, that can be called SVD, not called MCA. Okay, MC analysis show he based on MC analysis show the summer summer precipitation in U.S. June June A, and uh, but, but uh, this is the summer, so show there is a wave train from East Asia to here, and uh, so there is a uh, there is a link, uh, there is a a potential link. So that was his early results already demonstrate this link. 
And uh, also, we found uh, one is uh, the relation between Rocky Mountain and the Tibetan Plateau. So we choose five, uh, several warm years in Rocky Mountain and cold year. We do a difference for the May. So Rocky Mountain was very warm. Tibetan Plateau was cold. We choose some warm year from Tibetan Plateau and cold year from cold year from Tibetan Plateau. When when Tibetan Plateau was warm, this is cold. So as we just see, when Tibetan Plateau temperature is cold, like 2003 May, South Grand Plain was wet. And from all early studies shows, when spring Rocky Mountain was warm, so Tibetan uh, uh, Southern Grand Plain was wet. So this two forcing, they is play opposite face, and but they work in the same direction, produce a drought and wet conditions. So that's why we have to uh, move this, uh, go to the uh, North America. So here I summarize. So based on observational data analysis, so the bias analysis, we, we have established uh, so Tibetan Plateau, the global spring land survey temperature, summer survey temperature, global impact. And we identify, so far, we found the most effect is in east part of China, South Asia, Middle Latitude, North America, North, South, Northern South America, Sahel. But um, the thing is, as I point out, the model, example, may only produce 70% normally. So maybe in the future we have more, in particularly for the Eurasia. Uh, seems uh, at this point the model did not produce many signal here, but uh, we. We want to have a second phase with the Rocky Mountain. So Rocky Mountain effect certainly will be in America, but we also hope this effect and this head together will show a more a clear influence on the yeah, on the Eurasia con continent. Eurasia continent. So and uh, I have to point out that this at this stage the model. The most difficult thing is reproduce this dry and wet condition for two meter temperature. So those models have spent a great deal of efforts to find out a way, but this is a certainly a challenge for the land surface modeling and climate modeling. And uh, we want to, in the, the last one I point out, we want to can have this activity extend to the North America. And I hope uh, we'll have a workshop here in the September. <laughs> okay, start these uh, efforts. And uh, I already uh, you know, discussed with several agencies. Uh, hope uh, we can have a meeting here to start the second phase with uh, North America, with Rocky Mountain as uh, a focus. Thank you very much. Thank you for a very nice presentation. Um, I want to kind of add a point somehow you mentioned but didn't emphasize towards the end. Uh, when we look at when, when when we look at the teleconnection pattern between the East Asian rainfall and the uh, North American rainfall that was worked 20 years ago. Um, now, since that development, there's a lot of work in the, com in the monsoon community showing this kind of wave train that kind of what we call the circum global wave train that connects the, the East Asian side and the North American side during the spring and summer. The big debate is there whether this is internal variability to the monsoon, that's a system which is kind of that land area versus sea surface temperature. It turns out there is kind of even within the monsoon community, there's a big debate on that. So I think we were gonna also attack this problem of predictability by looking at subsets of this kind of prediction of how sea surface temperature could have affected that teleconnection and trying to, 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 to really isolate uh, the, uh, the, the road of land surface processes, especially the heated Tibetan plateau, which was not at least in my own work many years ago, we never considered that. But now it looks like the Tibetan Plateau would be key to actually determining whether this is 
internal variability with some people got biotropic instability, all kinds of atmospheric stuff, or is it land surface that contribute? And then we also need to separate the SST effect in it. So this is, is a really nice way to look at an old problem with a new with a new new view. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, so I that think, is an important uh, yeah, point. So you, uh, yeah. your pioneer work, uh, you know, at the one point because no follow up. So even you forgot. Uh, not until we have, forgot, yeah, he I forgot. forgot. Then we show these results. Then he memorized his <laughs> old paper. I was very glad that you know our our group, as four P group, we have in house the pioneer to <laughs> share this kind of ideas. Yeah, ideas. So Tibetan plateau has a special feature about the elevation. While you emphasize uh, so much on the you know, temperature, snowfall, it's the elevation itself uh, also a key factor. In other words, if you do experiment, do the same physical anomaly, but put on the normal sea level, what the effect will be? You mean the topographic effect? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So of course, the topographic effects, though, these things has been study for many years right. and they show how the Tibetan plateau topography forming you know influence the forming of Asia Monsoon so that is certainly is important important but uh, we this project is focused on the S2S aspect subsidial no seasonal you know not uh, focus on the uh, long term you know long term climatology yeah certainly topography there are many processes but uh, for the project because this project you know, we have no funding support. Each group, uh, they get approved from their institution get uh, to do the work for free work for this project. So we only can have a limited, uh, you know, uh, thing to do. You cannot, because everybody has their own research, like, you know, has their own research many. Uh, so they just squeeze some time to do the work. So very limited. Yeah. Thank you. Um, very nice. It's always nice oh, to be able you. to see these things. I'm curious about the global precipitation data set you yeah. used. They do you, um... the global uh, precipitation data set with some combination. Uh, one is using the uh, uh, we actually have two data. One is from Ensemble uh, the GPS uh, set. Another is uh, UK a climate uh, research unit. Yeah, yeah, you data. That was the land and uh, over. Ocean is uh, actually from, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, there is, uh, we just look, just look, make a composite from the ocean, uh, their current use. CMAP, CMAP is what we use, yeah. That'd be interesting, without funding, I'm not sure you can get in. Models, you've got a lot of different models. Yeah. And you're looking at the differences among them and the level and so on. There are differences in the specific data set. Yeah. And so it would be interesting to see areas that have greater differences and less differences and affect your significance for the results. So that would be an interesting subject. Actually, we plan to have a special issue climate dynamics. So, uh, you know, uh, we will uh, send email out, you know, uh, if any person like uh, you talk about the uncertainty in observation, how this will affect our, you know, certainly this uh, observation data is uh, really also a problematic for Tibetan Plateau. So Tibetan Plateau, we use the data was from China. From China, so meteorological administration, because only they have much more data, right? So that's why the land data actually is one is other parts from CAMS, but even the part was from CMA, Chinese Meteorological Administration, because that data and also data, between data data, there's a large discrepancy over the plateau, yeah. Other questions? Thanks, uh, speaker again. Okay, thank you. Oh, oh, okay, thank you for coming. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course. I, uh,